Hi there, and welcome back. If you didn't know, my name is Phil, and I'm from aquascapeguide.com. Today I wanted to talk about CO2 injection. Plants, being carbon-based organisms, need carbon as it's an essential building block for growth. Carbon dioxide is in abundance in our atmosphere, so terrestrial plants have access to it all the time. But CO2 levels underwater are much more scarce. Natural CO2 levels in our aquarium sit around 5 parts per million, which can be sufficient in our tanks with slower growing plants. But what if you want to pack your tank with tons of plants and have a lush looking garden? Then you'll probably need to inject CO2 into your tank to accommodate this growth and prevent algae like BBA that presents itself when CO2 is low or has been depleted. Now I know, a CO2 system can seem a little daunting, but it's really quite simple. Basically, CO2 is stored in a tank, it's then released and controlled by a regulator, and then gets pushed through a tube into our aquarium through something called a diffuser or a reactor. We set the regulator on its own timer so that we can turn the CO2 on and off independently from the aquarium light. When injecting CO2 into our aquariums, it turns into carbonic acid, dropping the pH of the aquarium water. We can tell how much CO2 is present in our water column by measuring how much the pH has dropped. The goal is to inject enough CO2 to drop our pH one full point, which puts us in the sweet spot for CO2, which is 30 parts per million. We'll talk more about how much to inject later. When purchasing your CO2 system, we'll need to take into consideration the size of your tank. For smaller tanks, like 5 to 40 gallons per se, a paintball tank setup is a very cost-effective way to go. They have little mini regulators that fits refillable paintball tanks, and even little ceramic diffusers you can toss into your tank to dissolve the CO2 into your water's column. A refillable paintball tank on our 28 gallon can last up to 2-3 to three months and can be refilled for as low as $5. With tanks this size, we do not recommend systems that you cannot refill as they are less sustainable and you'll be shelling out money on expensive recharge cartridges monthly. Now if you have a larger tank, like 75 gallons or more, a paintball tank setup is not going to be able to handle the injection rates needed to get to that sweet spot of 30 parts per million. That and you'll just be burning through these little paintball tanks weekly. You'll want to go with larger 5 to 10 pound tanks, and a fancy pants regulator, and most likely an inline reactor. Inline reactors are better at dissolving larger amounts of CO2 into your water column, as ceramic diffusers have a limit on how much CO2 can actually be pushed through them. Too much CO2 through a ceramic diffuser will result in really big bubbles that just float up to the top and right out of the tank immediately. We want to make sure that bubbles stay underwater so they diffuse into the water column and not just jump out of the tank. If you need help selecting parts for your system, we have product links at the bottom of our CO2 section at aquascapeguide.com. So now that we have all of our parts, how do we assemble our CO2 system? Well, we'll start by connecting the regulator onto our filled CO2 tank. Just know that if you buy a new CO2 tank, you'll need to get it filled. They do not ship with CO2 in them already as it's dangerous. If you're worried about the connection between the regulator and the CO2 tank leaking, you could add some gas tape to the threads of your CO2 tank, then screw the regulator on. Gas tape is generally yellow in color versus the plumber's tape which is generally blue. Once the regulator is screwed onto the tank, we need to add our CO2 grade tubing. It's important to get CO2 grade tubing as regular air tubing is cheap and can leak precious CO2 gas. Somewhere in our CO2 tubing, we need to install a check valve, and not one of those cheap little plastic ones, but a nice brass or metal one. This prevents water from getting siphoned through the CO2 tubing and into your regulator after the CO2 system shuts off. If water gets into the CO2 regulator, it can ruin it, so don't skip or go cheap on this part. From there, the CO2 tubing gets connected into the method of diffusion, which could be a ceramic diffuser or something like an inline reactor we talked about. And you're done. See, that wasn't that bad. Oh, actually, let's look at our regulator for a second. You're probably wondering what these gauges are. Regulators are generally made up of three different elements, two pressure gauges and one knob. One of the pressure gauges shows the pressure of your CO2 tank. These generally show full until the last week or so of the tank's life. It's good to keep an eye on this one so we know when our CO2 tank is about to run out. 
The next gauge is a working pressure gauge. This shows how much pressure will be released into our CO2 system. This gauge generally stays around 30 to 50 psi depending on the regulator you have. We need at least 30 psi to force CO2 through a ceramic diffuser. And lastly, the knob adjusts our needle valve. The needle valve controls the flow of CO2 into your aquarium. And this is how we turn the CO2 up and down. It's worth noting that with cheaper regulators, the needle valve are a little more finicky and harder to adjust than more expensive regulators. Now I'm not saying that everyone needs a $300 regulator, but just something worth noting. Okay, now that we got everything set up, we need to answer the question, well, how much CO2 do I really need to inject? As stated earlier, the goal is to drop your pH one full point and hold it there for the duration of the photo period. This means we have achieved the sweet spot of 30 parts per million in our water column while the plants are photosynthesizing. Photosynthesis is strongest right when the lights come on, so this is why we need to make sure we have enough CO2 in the water column before the lights turn on. But this pH drop doesn't happen quickly, so we generally need to inject CO2 for about one hour before the lights come on. And we can turn off the CO2 one hour before the lights turn off. Now we can't just willy-nilly start injecting CO2 and hope for the best, as too much CO2 in our aquariums can actually kill our livestock. So here's how we dial things in. We need to first start off by taking a pH reading before we inject any CO2 into the tank. This will be our base reading. This can be done with something like an API pH titration kit. I would avoid using pH test strips as they can be fairly inaccurate. But for example's sake, we'll say that our pH is at a 7.3 without any CO2 in the water column and our lights turn on at 10 a.m. We'll want to start injecting CO2 in our tanks one hour before the lights come on, so at 9 a.m. We achieve this by setting our regulator on its own timer, separate from the aquarium light. Again, if you have any livestock in your tank, start by just adding a little CO2 at the beginning. We can always turn it up. After the CO2 has been running for around an hour, and right before your lights turn on at 10 a.m., we need to test our pH again. If our pH has dropped from the 7.3 with our base reading to a 6.3 by 10 a.m., then we know we're injecting enough CO2 in our aquarium and hitting that sweet spot of 30 parts per million. But if we do that second test right before the lights come on and our pH is only at a 6.8 or let's say a 6.6 .6 by 10 a.m., we need to turn up our CO2 a bit to get closer to that one point pH drop. If we cannot turn up our CO2 anymore, as let's say the bubbles from our ceramic diffuser are getting so big that they're shooting out of the tank, we need to instead have the CO2 come on earlier, so like 8.30 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. This will give us a little more lead time to get that one point pH drop. Another thing worth noting is that we need to keep this one point pH drop until the CO2 turns off one hour before the lights turn off. For example, if our pH drops to 6.3, right before the lights come on, which is the ideal range, but then slowly raises back up to a 6.8 over the course of the photo period, this means the plants are consuming more CO2 than we're injecting, and we need to inject more. This is all a balance between how much we're injecting and how much lead time we give our CO2 prior to the lights coming on. It's just something that takes a little fine tuning before we get it dialed in, so be patient with yourself. Now, if you've heard about these before, you're probably asking yourself, why hasn't Phil talked about bubble counters or drop checkers yet? Well, in my opinion, they're just not good for dialing in CO2 injection rates, but they are good little visual aids. Bubble counters are a great little tool for smaller 10 to 40 gallon tanks, as we can visually see our adjustments to the CO2 knob in bubble form. We turn up the CO2 and see more bubbles. We turn down the CO2 and see less bubbles. Some people actually suggest the bubbles per second method, which is something like inject two to three bubbles per second for tanks around 25 gallons. But the problem with this is that all bubble counters are different. So a bubble on one person's bubble counter could be more or less CO2 than someone else's bubble counter. This is why it's not a reliable measurement for CO2 injection. That, and when we get to tanks that are 50, 80, 125 gallons or more, the CO2 flow will be so rapid that we won't even be able to see how many bubbles are being produced. As far as drop checkers go, 
In my humble opinion, they are also not a reliable way to dial in our CO2, as their readings are delayed up to one to two hours. The problem with this is we can be into dangerous levels of CO2 for our livestock, and our drop checker will still show us that we don't have enough CO2 in the tank. Furthermore, the reagent in drop checkers has to be changed out every so often, as it stops reacting to the pH change in our tank, giving us false readings. They also require that the water inside the drop checkers is at a KH of 4, so if you don't know how to make a solution with a KH of 4, then you'll also get false readings. But they do make a great little visual aid to show that we are getting CO2 dissolved into our water column. If there's no change in the drop checker, this could be a visual indication that your CO2 tank is empty, which is important to know. Again, to dial in your CO2, we just recommend sticking with the pH drop method, as it's the most consistent way to measure the amount of CO2 being injected into your water column. Lastly, I would like to bring up pH controllers. These are tools that measure the pH of your aquarium in real time, and inject more or less CO2 to keep that consistent one point pH drop. The downside is they can cost anywhere from $100 to $350, and their pH probes have to be calibrated and replaced over time, adding more cost to maintenance. These are great little tools, however, a little overkill in our opinion. But if you can afford one, then go for it. So what if we feel like we're injecting a lot of CO2, but are not getting that one point pH drop? Well, a few things could be contributing to that. The first thing is, is I would check your water's carbonate hardness, or KH. Your water's KH is like a rubber band that prevents pH swings in the tank. This can work against us when injecting CO2. The higher your KH, the more CO2 you'll need to inject to get that one point pH drop. The target KH for most planted tanks is a KH of four, unless the livestock in your tank needs something else. If your water's KH is really high, like in the teens or 20s, you might think about trying to reduce the KH to make injecting CO2 a little more effective. Another aspect that could be preventing your pH drop is surface agitation. Running an air stone or a sponge filter, having a sump that the water falls down into, or just agitation at the water surface with the outlet of our filter can off-gas the CO2 in your aquarium. We do want a little surface agitation to promote healthy gaseous exchanges, but not a lot. Like everything, we just need to make sure that there is a balance there, or understand that it can work against us. Another issue we could run into is a leak, but this is easily fixed. Put a little dish soap in water and mix it around for a bit. With the CO2 on, take a little bit of the soapy water and put a couple drops on the connections. Like where your CO2 tube maybe meets the regulator, or where your CO2 tube meets an external bubble counter, or sometimes your CO2 tubing can have little pinholes or cracks in the line. If you have a leak, you'll start seeing bubbles form where you put a few drops of the liquid, thus telling us where the leak is so you can address it. The last issue you could be running into is a poor method of diffusion. We talked about the fact that you could put too much CO2 through a little ceramic diffuser and the bubbles just shoot straight up out of the water surface. If this is happening, you'll wanna go with either a larger ceramic diffuser or move to an inline reactor. When diffusing CO2 into your water column, it's best to have the finest mist possible. We want these fine bubbles swirling around to make sure that all areas of our tank are receiving that CO2 enriched water. Well, that kind of covers everything. In summary, if you have a smaller tank, a paintball setup can be a very cost effective way to get into CO2. However, if you have a larger tank, it might be a little more costly. And remember that when dialing your CO2 in, just try to get as close as you can to that one point pH drop as possible. At the end of the day, just do your best. We've seen tanks thrive with less than that one point pH drop, as CO2 in general just makes the plants really happy. And with a nice amount of light and CO2, the plants are just gonna be burning through that fertilizer and nutrients. Oh yeah, we totally have to talk about how to feed our plants as your tank is gonna need a lot of nutrients when injecting CO2. But I gotta go do a water change, so let's do that in the next video. And if you haven't already, check out the CO2 section of our guide at aquascapeguide.com. Alrighty, see you in the next video.